This talk is um, is about some uh, combinatorial and topological uh, aspects of uh, finite rank systems. So I will start recalling the basic definitions um, and uh, give some the problematic. Uh, I will survey a few results, um, then try to give some ideas on some special topics, and then uh, ask uh, a few questions that uh, that we have. So um, please, if you have any question, just just let me know. <clears throat> so. Uh, Probably this will appear many times, the basic definition, so I will go more or less quickly. So I will take a finite alphabet, and I will, here I will write the, the shift as the transformation S. So I will not use the, the, the letter sigma because this, I, I will use that a bit later, but uh, um, so S will, uh, capital S will be the shift, this is the shift map. And, um, here, I will be uh, working with closed subsets of uh, a shift space that I will call generically, sorry, here it should be S, that I will uh, call generically, um, ah, sorry. Hi, Sebastian. I think uh, yeah. all I see are two arrows chasing themselves. Uh, we don't see the slides. Ah, you don't see the slides, okay. Um, maybe only the organizers, see? Okay, some people see. I, mean, I can see. <laughs> I with my computer, let me try to log, sorry about that. Ah, okay. J just let me know if if there is any problem. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here we have, um, uh, I will use this generic notation to denote the subshift. And uh, as usual, we say that the word, this is finite word, it's a finite, uh, finite uh, sequence of, of symbols, appears in the shift if you can see that word in some, in some point of, of, uh, of your shift space. And, <clears throat> This is also probably well known. The language are all the language of say uh, size uh, of words of size length the n is uh, uh, it's all the finite words that appear somewhere in X. And <clears throat> here this is one that will be one of the main objects we will study. This is the complexity the complexity function. I apologize for my bad handwriting. This is the complexity function that counts the number of uh, finite uh, length words, the words of length n in the in the subject. And <clears throat> just to recall uh, the the topological entropy, I will write it like that of the subshift is just the exponential growth rate of this uh, of this. Um, of this function. So this is the limit of the logarithm of this function, and you divide that by n. This is the topological entropy. <clears throat> and uh, this, this quantity, the complexity function, has been studied by several authors, and some, uh, in some uh, restricted cases, this complexity function tell us some things about, uh, about the system itself. <clears throat> so let me go to the next one um, and some motivation about this complexity function is that um, <clears throat> there are some complexity restrictions for systems uh, uh, regarding this complexity function so the probably the the most known well known result is when the you have a your system is finite if and only if this complexity function is, is bounded and the next step is 
what uh, what I will call the non-superlinear complexity case, which will be when the uh, the Liminf, sorry, which will be when the Liminf of the complexity function divided by n, this is a finite number. <clears throat> so this will be the non-superlinear complexity, and <clears throat> this case poses several restrictions. And <clears throat> let me uh, just start with the obvious one. They system with having this condition, they have zero entropy. This is just because the entropy is the exponential growth rate of this. And if this is, uh, say, it has this, con this uh, growth rate condition, this cannot be positive. So this is a <clears throat> uh, almost uh, immediate consequence. And a less uh, uh, trivial consequence is that system like this have a finite number of ergodic measures. So let's say finite number of ergodic measures. And here, let me men mention some names. So uh, this was first observed by Bocernitsen in, I think, uh, 1985, 84, <clears throat> which showed that um, the, this number here bounds, or this number, uh, if this number is finite, then you have a finite number of ergodic measures. And here, ergodic measures are all the invariant, uh, so all, all the, uh, the extreme points of the set of uh, invariant measures. <clears throat> um, and this has, uh, this uh, property has been studied more in uh, details very recently. So there are, let me mention there are some recent uh, results by, uh, uh, Van Sier, Brain Accra. This is, I think, 2019, where <clears throat> they studied the number of ergodic measures and, uh, and generic measures and give a more precise uh, bounds. Uh, I will just comment that this has been studied recently. Just to, to give a complete uh, list of references, <clears throat> there is also a result by Damron and Fickenscher. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing it wrongly. This is 2017. And I think this will be, uh, or something related to their result will be uh, in a talk tomorrow. So I advertise this talk about uh, related results. <clears throat> and there is also a recent paper by Dijkstra, uh, Orms, and Pavlov where they um, extend results to transitive subjects. So here, everything is uh, minimal. And they studied for, uh, uh, give more results for transitive systems. <clears throat> okay, so this is just to say that system with this uh, condition have some um, rigidity properties. And, and I mean rigidity in a very, uh, vague uh, sense. Rigidity is what I'm writing here. That they have zero entropy, they have a finite number of ergodic measures. And um, there is another uh, property that this system have, and is that I will maybe call it here. Um, and that they have a restricted automorphism group or constrained automorphism group. constraint automorphism group. And here, the automorphism group of the shift is uh, all the homomorphisms, they call it H, all the homomorphisms such that they commute with the shift action. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is the, the automorphism group. And in these systems, this is constrained. And this is, uh, uh, so there are also very recent results uh, about this question. And I think to be more or less complete with the references, the first uh, result in this direction was given by Salo and Torma. Uh, I think this is 2013, where they show that, <clears throat> uh, 
maybe I will write here the condition, is that if you consider the automorphism group uh, and you quotient by the group generated by the shift, this is finite. So this is what was first observed by, uh, uh, proved by Sol, uh, Salo and Torma in 2013 for some classes of substitutions. Um, um, and then we have uh, Van Sir and, and, and Brian Akra, and also uh, myself with Fabian, Fabian Durand, uh, Alejandro Mas, and Samuel Petit, where we show that <coughs> non superlinear complexity, so the condition having the, the Liminf, the complexity finite. This is the non superlinear uh, condition. This implies that this object is finite. The, the group of the automorphism divided by the, uh, by the shift, by the group generated by the shift, is a finite group. And so that, that is, uh, sorry, I forgot uh, to mention the, uh, here there is also a was uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I forget if I write correctly and Coven, I think. <clears throat> the same around the same time. Um, <clears throat> and actually, all this, all this uh, result use a condition I will call three prime which is that um, this algebraic condition is a consequence of having a, a finite number of, of asymptotic component, finite number of asymptotic component. And what is this? So, Two points in the subshift are asymptotic. If they are equal, uh, they have equal uh, values starting from some point. So the typical this picture is something like that. So for starting from some point, the, the sequences coincide. And after that point, they differ somewhere. Probably we can think that they differ there. And after that, they are equal. <clears throat> And uh, being asymptotic is an equivalence relation, so you can talk about asymptotic components. And the property behind this uh, property three is that such systems with this condition have a finite number of asymptotic components. <clears throat> um, so to summarize this slide, we have this uh, complexity restriction, and we want to understand what uh, rigidity properties implies. So here I mentioned uh, three or four of them. Okay, any questions so far? A question in the room. Sorry, it's, uh, okay. is it uh, working? Yes, okay. Uh, when you say finite number of asymptotic components, so do you mean like uh, any configuration is not asymptotic to itself? Because if this holds, then ah yes, yes, sorry, yeah, no, non-trivial asymptotic components. Uh, non-trivial, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So here I have some uh, restrictions. Let me go up. Have zero entropy, find a number of ergodic measures, constraint automorphism group. And uh, this uh, finite number of asymptotic components, non trivial asymptotic components. So then we can ask if all these restrictions that appear here are really, uh, maybe they're more general. Maybe they appear in some with some topological assumption uh, more general than this uh, combinatorial this combinatorial property. Uh, 
So if you look at the restrictions one and two that I have here, zero entropy and finite number of ergodic measures, one, one could guess a class of systems that, that, uh, that one could try to understand to see if, all, if those systems are actually, uh, if that class of system is actually the one uh, having all these uh, restrictions uh, that I mentioned here. So, I, I, that, and this is what we call the finite rank system. And to define finite rank systems, which is the, 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 the title, uh, I will have to introduce briefly what is called uh, the bratelli versic diagram. Uh, probably there will be more talks about this, so uh, I will spend a few minutes talking about this representation and then mention some, some results. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so as I mentioned uh, before, the motivation was to understand all these restrictions that the non-superlinear complexity gives and try to see if there is some uh, more general class maybe defined not in that uh, combinatorial terms as having uh, non-superlinear complexity that also has all those uh, rigidity properties. <clears throat> and uh, that's uh, what will be the class of finite rank systems that I will introduce in a few moments. <clears throat> okay, so to do that, I have to tell you about the bratelli bershik diagram. So what is a bratelli bershik diagram? It's, um, it's a graph, infinite graph, where you can uh, put different uh, vertices in different levels. And uh, you can connect, say, a level with the next one and uh, with nothing else. So you, you can uh, you put together all vertices in a given level, and then uh, you have um, an infinite graph like this. And uh, the assumption is that here you have one special, um, one special vertex, vertex um, which is, is the root of the diagram. <coughs> So here I have vertices, edges between levels, and that's basically what is a bertelli bershik uh, diagram. Yeah, I can do this. Okay. <clears throat> so between two levels, I will call those levels, and uh, uh, in principle, I should name uh, name them all differently. So this will be should be one sub n minus one, but to lighten the the notation, I will uh, just write one, two, three, etc. So this, what is, uh, these are what are called levels. You have in one level a set of uh, vertices, uh, and in the next level you have another set of vertices, different vertices, and what you have is you have some uh, edges connecting them, and that's uh, the structure of a given level. And you have that for uh, infinitely many levels, and this gives you a, a Bratelli diagram. Okay, <clears throat> and the next uh, thing concerning these uh, structures is for any given uh, vertex, you have an order, you have an order in the edges that arrive to that ver vertex. Like the, the edges like that are pointing uh, uh, up, say. And here I wrote uh, this order, one, two, three, four. But this, uh, I will be considering this type of order, but it's just for convenience. I, I will order them from left to the right. But this could be any any order. Could be one, could be one, uh, three, two, etc. Can be any. It can be any order. But uh, for the sake of uh, the clarity, I, I will. Just uh, I will mainly use from left to the right, <clears throat> and uh, having done that, you can create uh, what's called the bratelli versic map, which is as follows. And I, I will not describe it uh, formally. I will just give a few examples, and uh, let's hope things will be clear. <clears throat> um, so given this Bratelli uh, diagram, you can associate the set of all infinite paths. It's the set of all infinite paths. Uh, 
uh, when I mean path is, uh, I, I will read the, um, the edges of this graph. This is an infinite path. And <clears throat> um, you, we can define the bratelli uh, Bershik map as the successor map. So I will give this example here, and uh, let's see if, if it's clear. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, actually the most easy example one can imagine. We will have one vertex at each level, and we will connect with two, uh, with two uh, edges to the next one. So here, this continues. Huh? I just wrote a, a portion of it. <clears throat> and here, I'm, I'm drawing one uh, path, this one in green. So the successor map will be, I will look, I will look down till I find uh, something that is not maximum. Uh, here I'm also considering uh, the order from left to right. So this is smaller than this one. So remember in each uh, vertex I had an order uh, that allows me to compare the, the edges that are uh, arriving to this to this vertex. So <clears throat> if you will, if we look at the this path in green, um, so the, the rule is I will look down till I find something that is not maximum. So see, see here, if I start looking down, I will find this uh, this edge that is not maximum. So I will mark it. It's not maximum. And uh, what I will do, I will uh, move it to the next one. In the, in the order I have. So here I'm, I'm given an order. I will move it to the next one. Um, so this will be moved to the next one. And I erase everything I had uh, above. But so I, I erase what I had uh, before. And to, uh, to draw what I had here, I will come back with the minimum path. So I will choose at any step, the minimum path that allows me to come back. So in this case, it's just that. So this is the this is the um, successor map. And if we think of this as a sequence of zeros and ones, so where say this is a zero and this is a one, so the one in the left is a zero and the one in the right is a one. <clears throat> what we have done here is that uh, let me go back. Is that here the the sequence will be. Uh, one zero zero. So what we did is that one zero zero something. Uh, it went to uh, sorry. No, I didn't have. I have that one. One zero zero. Ah, it's okay. One zero zero. It went to uh, zero one zero. <clears throat> so this is an. Uh, this can be seen as. Uh, adding one in the in this DI group, and what is adding one? I add the coordinate, and if uh, and I keep the the uh, how it's called the well, I forgot the name in English. Uh, carry. Here, when I add one, the carry. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, I I add the I add one here, so this one becomes zero, and I, I keep the carry here, and I put it there. And I continue later. <clears throat> so someone that, uh, if, if you haven't looked at this kind of dynamics, uh, if you have never looked at this, then maybe you are asking yourself, what happens if I never find uh, uh, something that is not maximum? Well, in that case, you send to the path that is, um, everything is a minimum. Of course, if that is well defined, if there is only one maximum and one minimum. <clears throat> Okay, but this is just to give a, a taste of what is uh, dynamics in this kind of uh, maps. <clears throat> this example here is what is called an odometer. It's an uh, odometer or adding machine. It's like you, you have a, a group operation, and what you are doing, the successor dynamics is adding some uh, fixed element. <clears throat> so this is an odometer. Um, and what is the particular aspect of the odometer is that in each level you have one one vertex and actually that's what characterizes uh, the odometers in this context <coughs> um, okay so 
And then I will just draw a few pictures that, so you can imagine what happens when you have more complicated structure. Here, the structure was quite simple, just one vertex at its level, but you can have much more complicated structures. And uh, the dynamics is exactly the same. It's, it's just more difficult to look at it, but the, the idea is the same. So <clears throat> here, for instance, let's consider this, part, uh, this path in, in, in uh, green. Of course, this continues uh, down, but I just draw a portion of it. <clears throat> so the dynamics is you uh, go down till you find something that you can move, something that is not the maximum. So in this case, so this is maximum, this is maximum, and this is not maximum. So I should be able to move that one. So I, I mark that as non the maximum, and then I move it there, and then I come back to the to the top following the minimum path. So that that's uh, one iteration of of the successor map. And uh, if your if your graph is uh, complicated enough, you will have a complicated enough dynamics. <clears throat> so that was uh, the what I wanted to say about this, uh, these uh, maps. <clears throat> Any question? If not, uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, <clears throat> okay. So why one could, one, uh, could ask after all these definitions, uh, what is the class of systems that can be built like that? Like that? And <clears throat> uh, here, two important theorems are the following ones. <clears throat> Just to mention the condition uh, that we will be using, the diagram is, is simple if you can connect uh, nodes or vertices uh, that are far away in the, in the diagram. And this is the condition to have a minimal dynamics. Minimal dynamics means that uh, every, every orbit is, a dense, is dense in the, the space. <clears throat> So, uh, say a fundamental result in this uh, in this context is a theorem in the '92 by Hermann Putman and Sko that showed that actually any minimal Cantor dynamics, any minimal Cantor system, can be represented in this way. So, uh, and here, minimal Cantor system means that it's a minimal uh, topological system, and the space is a Cantor space. So, uh, this is a Cantor space. So this is kind of a universality, universality or a represent, representation theorem of all dynamics that happen in a Cantor system, in a Cantor space. All of them can be represented as uh, I said before. <clears throat> so the class of systems we can treat with these uh, diagrams is quite uh, is, is big. It's all all Cantor systems, <clears throat> and the the definition we will be uh, discussing next is the one of finite rank. The one here, finite rank. <clears throat> so a system is of finite rank if I can represent it as uh, previously with the diagram where the number of vertices uh, doesn't increase to infinity. So let me go back here. Here I could have that when I go more down, the number of vertices can go to infinity and this is a valid uh, system, it's a valid dynamics. But <clears throat> in the case where this uh, doesn't happen, or when you can represent it in a way that this doesn't happen, this is called a finite rank system. <clears throat> so all systems that can be represented in this way. And <clears throat> um, this uh, class of system starts to exhibit some rigidity uh, properties. And the first one is, this theorem by uh, Tomas Donarovic and Alejandro Mas from 2008 that says that if you have a system like this where you can, where that can be represented with a uh, diagram uh, uh, finite, where the number of vertices is bounded, then it's either expansive, meaning a subshift, or an odometer, like the situation I, I draw in the beginning. You have one vertex, and you just you are just adding a fixed number, a fixed element in that group. <clears throat> so this is a dichotomy theorem that says everything in that class is a subshift or 
is an key continuous system. It's a rotation in on a compact abelian group. So here we have a first restriction to this class. Because if you are wondering, counter space, it can be uh, all subshifts are uh, happening in a counter space, uh, but you can have things that are not expansive. So uh, not everything is a subshift. <clears throat> okay. So this is a very first result. And this, uh, uh, this theorem says that, well, more or less we can focus on, um, on subshifts because the other case would be a dometer and dometer is, is, <coughs> is uh, in, it's easier to understand. And <coughs> this class of systems was studied in details in 2012 by Besugli, Kiatowski, Medinets, and Solomiak. <clears throat> and they exhibited, they exhibited uh, some rigidity properties that I will briefly mention here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the first uh, uh, property they prove is that they have a finite number of ergodic measures. Finite number of ergodic measures. As much as uh, like in the case of uh, non superlinear complexity. <clears throat> and actually, the number of ergodic measure is bounded by the rank. Bounded less than the rank. So the. Um, uh, maybe I didn't mention the rank is like the number of uh, vertices that you can use at each level to represent the system, the minimum number. <clears throat> and uh, so this system have finite number of ergodic measures and they have zero entropy. What they showed is that uh, they have zero entropy for any invariant measure, which of course uh, implies that by the variational principle that the topological entropy is zero, zero entropy. <clears throat> so we have this rigid, rigid conditions in this class. Uh, which are the ones I mentioned in the beginning that happen for non superlinear systems. <clears throat> so, here uh, we can ask what, how about the next, uh, the next uh, restriction? Uh, <clears throat> so, let me. <clears throat> and uh, uh, before presenting the next res restriction, I will put in context. Uh, this uh, class of systems with uh, the condition we had in non superlinear complexity. Uh, so, this is a recent part of a recent uh, joint work with uh, Fabian Duran, uh, Alejandro Marx, and Samuel Petit. And we show that the condition of non superlinear complexity actually uh, fits in this class, meaning that if a system is like that, has non superlinear complexity, then is has to be of finite rank. So is of the form um, I described uh, before. This uh, gives an indirect uh, say, proof that this system have a finite number of ergodic measures. Um, for instance, using the previous result uh, I mentioned here in the in this slide. Um, but it's very indirect. It's, it's not really optimal in the in the in the sense of the number. <clears throat> so then one can ask <clears throat> very quickly if maybe this complexity condition characterizes this topological condition of finite rank, and this is false. Actually, even with rank two systems, so these are this is a system that is given by two uh, uh, two vertices at each level. Um, in this class, in a system like this, you don't have, you may, you may not have a condition uh, with the complexity. So there are examples where the complexity grows more than linear, so superlinear complexity, but it's of a finite rank. <clears throat> so just to draw a picture, here we have the finite rank systems. Um, and here inside we have non superlinear. This is non superlinear. 
Uh, and this is uh, these two classes are different. And I mentioned in the beginning that this non-superlinear class presents some uh, restrictions, like entropy, uh, number of ergodic measures, which are also uh, that also happens in finite rank. But they also have this uh, automorphism group uh, restrictions and the asymptotic pair uh, restriction. So the, the first question that one could ask is, are those uh, conditions also satisfied in finite run system? So let me show you <coughs> some questions. So these are some questions that uh, we pose in the, the paper, but they are already solved. <coughs> so first question is, does a minimal uh, finite run system have many, many finitely many asymptotic components. And this was uh, solved by Bastian Spinoza, which is a graduate student of uh, Alejandro and, and Fabian. Um, and this, this condition of, sorry? So, sorry, uh, there is a question of uh, Boris Solomiak. Yeah, he's asking uh, how fast can the complexity grow for finite trunk? Ah, okay. yeah, very uh, good question. Um, I actually I, I I wrote it down in the end, so maybe we can talk about that in the end. Uh, I I I actually wrote it. So that's an open question I, I want to ask. <coughs> so this is um, this was already solved. This is I think two thousand twenty. And this, of course, implies that the automorphism group of these uh, systems is also constrained. <clears throat> and uh, some other topological consequences or questions that is every factor of finite rank also finite rank. This was not clear at all, but this was also solved by uh, 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 Golestani uh, Bastian also. And Golestani, I'm sorry if I pronounce it correctly, and Hosseini. This is also 2020. <coughs> and um, this was recently, like last month, solved by also by, by Bastian Spinoza. That in terms of symbolic factors, this class is also very restricted, has finitely many of them. Have, it has finitely many factors up to topological conjugacy. <clears throat> and uh, I advertise that we have here talks on, on Thursday. So I advertise these talks that will be uh, on Thursday. And <clears throat> I, uh, I think they will talk more in details ab about these results. So I will just mention that. I have another question. Okay. <clears throat> and related to this, all these topological questions, uh, one of the aspects I would like to treat in this uh, class of systems is the complexity one. Uh, <clears throat> so that that is what we are going to discuss more in details in, in what follows. What is the complexity? What is the complexity of finite rank systems? We know it's a zero entropy, but uh, what is a possible uh, complexities you can see, and how how can you control them? If I give you an example, how how can you uh, estimate the complexity? <clears throat> and to do so. I will introduce a few notions of uh, morphisms and uh, esthetic subjects, which are, are a bit more uh, convenient to, um, to discuss this question. So. <clears throat> and <clears throat> here I, I will give a few more definitions. I, uh, morphism will be any uh, map, I will call it, say, to, from an alphabet to another one that it's, uh, you can think of this as the um, concatenation of uh, images 
of any symbol. So, so of a sequence, finite sequence, say a, a of a word, it's just the concatenation of the <clears throat> the image of uh, each letter. Uh, that that's what I will call a morphism. I uh, I will not call it a substitution because the alphabets may be different. So to restrict the word substitution for same alphabet, I will call this a morphism. <clears throat> and given a sequence of uh, morphisms, uh, here positive, I will restrict to positive morphisms. And positive means that if I write a letter, say if I write to of A, I will see some letters, B1, B2, etc. Um, I want to see all of them. So all letters appear in the images of uh, of the letters in the in the, alpha, in the alphabet in the uh, in the beginning this is the same as when you construct the matrix associated to this morphism uh, you have a positive matrix <clears throat> and this is not a restrictive assumption uh, all the systems we are looking at can be can be considered with this condition. So it's not it's not anything it's, it's not restrictive just to it makes things easier. <clears throat> so we have a sequence of positive morphisms where the alphabets might be different. Um, and having that sequence of morphism we can build what is called the SADIC subshift associated to the sequence of morphisms which is given by the following uh, condition. A point <clears throat> is in the subshift if uh, the finite words of this point can be obtained iterating some letter from far, uh, uh, from far away. So <clears throat> let me try to uh, do the picture. I have a sequence of morphisms. Uh, this is OK. Rows from an given alphabet. Um, the uh, next one, and uh, <clears throat> this goes to um, say tau zero. So here I have a my my original alphabet a zero. You have alphabet a one. You have some uh, way to send letters here into uh, words here. And the point in this subshift belongs to the this alphabet, the first alphabet, to the Z. And the point is in there if when I take any subword of it, so here I will take a subword, this subword comes from iterating some uh, some letter in some say alphabet say that this is this is the AK and uh, you iterate this with all the morphisms and when you do that you have a word that uh, sees this finite word other way. To say it is that you start uh, iterating morphisms from far and far away, and the limit points you get are the points in the SAD exception. <clears throat> so these are uh, like a generalization of the substitution, but you allow the alphabets and the morphisms to change every time. <clears throat> so this is a way to to uh, to build a, what is called the SAD uh, subshift, um, and what actually what it's uh, proved um, in the recent results I mentioned uh, is that this this is intimately related to the finite run systems and uh, how to relate this class of system with the finite run systems is that finite run systems are exactly the systems where the, you can control the, the size of the alphabet. Here, 
the alphabet can grow, can grow to infinity, the size, the size can grow to infinity. But if you're, if you're strict to morphisms uh, that, uh, where the alphabet doesn't grow to infinity, then you actually get the same, uh, the same uh, class of uh, finite ground system. And this, this will be explained in details, I think, in the talks on Thursday. Because this is the it's a theorem. It's not it's not uh, it's not trivial. <clears throat> I mean, the, probably it's um, uh, one can expect some some this type of result, but there is some technical things to do in the middle. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so but the next question is: if I give if I give you the sequence of morphisms. How can you compute the complexity? Or is there any way you can compute the complexity? Um, <clears throat> so this is the next. Uh, I will uh, spend the remaining minutes of my talk talking about this. So how, is, how to estimate the, this complexity? With other, when, when I give you an example or in some classes, etc. <clears throat> and uh, well, of course, there are some known case substitutions. Substitution is one that all the morphisms are equal to the same, to a given morphism. So there is only one morphism that you repeat infinitely many times. And this case, in this case, the, the, the complexity is sublinear. Meaning it's a bounded, it's a P of N, it's, it's uh, bounded by a constant times N. <clears throat> Um, another class that is uh, well studied in, uh, uh, in symbolic dynamics is the linearly recurrent uh, subshift. I, I will not give the like the original definition, but this will be when the morphisms you have a finite set of finite set of morphisms, so finite set of morphisms, and in this case. The complexity is also sublinear. Also sublinear. <clears throat> so it's a finite set of morphisms that you uh, that you, sh you choose how you start iterating them, <clears throat> and then there is the finite rank, which uh, you can uh, ask what are the complexities that are here, but this is always our exponential because, well, it has uh, zero entropy. Okay. So the, the what we tried to develop was some ideas to compute the complexity in some examples or in some classes. And I will uh, mention you some of the tools we we saw or we tried to uh, to create um, to to compute the complexity. Yeah, here everything I'm, I'm I'm talking about is minimal and the morphisms are positive. <clears throat> okay, and to understand how is the complexity, we will have to look at this. Uh, these quantities. So for a, for a morphism, let's uh, denote the uh, double uh, bar of, of the morphism, the, uh, the maximal length of, uh, of tau of a letter. So you, you write down, so you have your letter A, B, C, say, you write the substitution, and you may have that some letters give you a very long word, some other letters give you a very short word. Um, so I will write with this the longest, the longest uh, length, and with this symbol, the shortest. And, and actually we'll see that these two quantities uh, are behind uh, the complexity. So if you have a morphism where these two things are very different, you, you can achieve very uh, non-trivial complexities, like high complexity. 
Okay, so here there is a first tool to understand the complexity. That is, and it's what we call the repetition complexity. And okay, the definition, I will just write how to compute it. Suppose that you have uh, A that gives you uh, A, B, C, A, B. <clears throat> so what this, what this uh, uh, complexity or this quantity means is that you will count for each letter, you will count how many times you change the letter. So here we started with B, with A. So I will start with one because I'm using a letter. Then here I, I, I change the letter, I will plus one. Here I change another letter, I will plus one. Here I change another. Well, this is a bad example. It doesn't illustrate what's happening. Maybe let's say that I have many Bs and in the end an A. So here I'm not changing the letter. Here I change the letter. I plus plus one. So the <clears throat> this when I do this, I count one, two, three, four, five, six. And I do that for every letter. So B will give me something, say seven. And I add all those quantities. And this is what we uh, call the repetition complexity. With how many times? Uh, you can um, you need to change the letter in the in the morphism, and that should be related to the complexity because if you if you change too much, you are creating uh, many words somehow, and <clears throat> that is exactly what it happens. This is a computation um, uh, that I will just write the like form of it but it can be very it can be done much more precisely <clears throat> and um, proposition with this uh, quantity is the following suppose you have a subshift a subject subshift then you can bound the complexity in an n or for, for a large enough n by <clears throat> so this is a it's not a precise bound but it will tell it will work to illustrate the result so you bound by the maximum of the alphabets. Of course, this makes sense only if the, I mean, this is meaningful only in the case where the alphabets remain bounded. And then you multiply this by the, the link soup of this uh, complexity that I defined previously. So you, you start computing how you, the morphism changes the letters. And you have to multiply that by the size of the, the maximum of the alphabets, and this is the constant term that uh, goes with n. Of course, this can, this can grow, but uh, this is meaningful only when this is bounded, because it will give us some information when the system have sublinear complexity. <clears throat> so if you have a, a static subshift where we can bound these two things, then the system has sublinear, compl uh, sublinear complexity. These are, uh, are quite strong conditions, but I, I included it here just to illustrate um, how to use that notion. But it can be, it can be described much more precisely. <clears throat> we can talk afterwards if, if you have uh, any doubt. And as a consequence of this result, we deduce some result in the equivalence, uh, uh, strongly uh, orbit equivalence uh, theory that says that if you have any finite topological rank, then it's a strongly orbit equivalent to something of sublinear complexity. Uh, meaning, uh, yeah, I will just say it with words, that means that you can send orbits to orbits in a somehow continuous way. <clears throat> uh, but this uh, notion, Preserves, for instance, the set of invariant measures uh, and some other, and the dimension group, of course. And this proposition gives, for instance, an al alternative proof that uh, finite uh, rank systems have finitely many ergodic measures because you, it's equivalent to sub something of sublinear complexity. But of course, <clears throat> there we lose the precise <clears throat> bound. So it's, it's just a, an observation. 
and uh, so this is this uh, <clears throat> complexity uh, notion allows us to um, compute some things. But <clears throat> actually, there is a more precise notion that we describe that is the complexity of uh, relative complexity of morphisms. This is somehow how how are how the morphisms in the SADIC representation are being related. Um, <clears throat> so I think I have very few minutes, so probably I will skip that part. If you have, if you want to take a look at this, uh, uh, we can talk afterwards. But this is a <clears throat> more precise notion to compute the complexity. The, the previous one is easy to is easy to compute in examples, but it uh, is highly non-optimal to compute the complexity. This one is a bit better computing the complexity, but it might be more complicated in examples. But uh, okay, I will skip this because uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and a consequence of these computations is that one can say when a system has zero entropy, and it's it has to do with the <clears throat> the length, the how the alphabet, the exponential growth of the alphabets. Uh, compared to the smallest word of the sequence of morphisms. Uh, <clears throat> this is probably folklore result, but uh, we gave a very concise proof of this. In particular, finite rank have zero entropy. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I, well, some other consequence that subquadratic complexity is always true when you have a, uh, two. Uh, alphabets of size two. Um, and, <clears throat> okay, since I ran out of time, let me go to the questions, which I probably are more interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so here are a few questions that are still open, and maybe the specialists can say if they make sense, right? people that have worked more in finite rank system. So the first thing is, if you can uh, control in a polynomial way the complexity of a finite rank system. <clears throat> so can it be, can you find a degree that controls the polynomial, uh, the complexity of uh, the finite rank system? Or maybe not. And uh, give an example where you cannot do that. This is the uh, first question. So what I, I said previously is that when the alphabet is of uh, size two, you can do it. And <clears throat> the second question is, if you can characterize complexity and having topological uh, finite rank in some subclass of systems, for instance, we don't know if these conditions are equivalent in the topics class. Maybe in the topics class, having finite topological rank is the same as having non superlinear complexity. There is some evidence that uh, supports uh, that, but I, I will not uh, mention that. We can discuss it later if you have any questions. <clears throat> and then we have a variety. Of other questions. Of that, okay, uh, so, thank you, Sebastian. Maybe okay. we, we thank you, Sebastian. pass to the questions. Uh, there is a question in uh, uh, the chat room of uh, uh, Sejal Babel. He's uh, uh, asking what can be said if the minimality condition is replaced by unique uh, minimal subset, in, the, in, the, in particular in the result of um, finite trunk. Uh, when uh, the, the condition of uh, non-superlinear non complexity implies uh, finite trunkness. Um, uh, if you have... Um, I'm not sure. I... I should place 
I'm uh, I'm not sure uh, like what happens if you drop minimality. Probably you can say things, but I haven't thought about it. Um. Okay, uh, there is another question of uh, Martin Lustig. Uh, he's uh, asking in the chat. Uh, <laughs> And say well, what about uh, for replacing for subshifts the water reverse crank by the by a nesadic crank defined through the existence of a nesadic development, which is everywhere growing, of booted uh, level alphabet ranks and perhaps also recognize, uh, recognizable on each level. Ah, this um, yeah um. And, and uh, you mean not uh, not uh, positive, maybe? Um, I think actually this question of uh, Martin will be it's one of the things that uh, will be discussed on Thursday. And I think that's one is a recent paper of, uh, of uh, Bastian Spinoza where he addresses that question. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, so I think there is some development of that. Other question in the room? No. Uh, a question of uh, Dan Rust. Uh, would you uh, is what ask that the lens of each morphism um, is bounded? What's happened in this case? Uh, related to Martin, uh, Martin questions. Oh. No, they don't need to be bond, bonded. They can, the, the size can grow. Yeah. Which uh, Will always happen uh, if you telescope the diagram, like in, if you look at it in the in the Bratelli version. So you can you are allowed to do that. Okay, so let's thank uh, Sebastian. Thank you.